talking about the red-headed giants of the Lovelock Caves in the state of Nevada. For more than a century, a story has persisted about the skeletons of giants, of all things, being found in the Lovelock Caves in northern Nevada. Famed Paiute Sarah Winnemucca first wrote an acclaimed book back in the late 1800s. In this book, she writes that the Paiutes waged a three-year war against a tribe of red-headed cannibals. The Paiute Native Americans are said to have trapped these cannibals, then killed them. The last of these red-headed giants were trapped inside a cave outside of Lovelock, Nevada. To help us understand this legend of these caves, we will be talking with the YouTuber, Burning Sands Exploration. Cindy is a Nevada local and knows a lot about these caves. Our guest, Burning Sands Exploration, has a wonderful YouTube channel. She and I have been friends for quite some time now, so I'm really excited to have her. What Cindy does is that she explores all sorts of things in northern Nevada. She explores everything from ghost towns, museums, abandoned places, and a whole lot more. And she has visited the Lovelock Caves numerous times. And she actually doesn't live too far from these caves, so she gets to visit them quite a bit. She actually has a wonderful video up where she explores the caves. And I've put a link in the description of this episode to that video and her channel. So let's welcome Cindy to the Strange YouTube Video Show and Podcast. Welcome, Cindy. Well, hi. Thank you for having me. It is so great having you. I can't believe it's taken us this long to get together and do this. Absolutely. (laughs) This is so fun. Thank you. So first off, tell us about your channel. Um, I do um, mostly desert exploration. um, And I will go anywhere that I can get into for like mine explorers or ghost towns or that sort of thing. And I do cover museums too, because I think it's important to... um, see the history of the area. And I love the history of Nevada. You know, when you go into these museums, it it also gives you ideas of things that you didn't even know existed in your own area or around that area. I love going into museums. I get some of my best ideas in in the museums. I do too. And it's just, uh, there's so much history out here. And it's just uh, absolutely fascinating to see what they went through and the tools that they used, and even the Native American exhibits are very fascinating. Yeah, you sent me some wonderful pictures of stuff that came out of those caves, and I would now I'm excited to stop at that museum on my way out to California. And that's the thing is that I actually traveled that road quite a bit to go out to California to see our oldest, and you know, you kind of zigzag across northern (laughs) Nevada from Colorado to the Bay Area, And the whole time you're like, oh my gosh, there's nothing out here. And you're like so bored. And then I met you. (laughs) (laughs) And I realized I have been driving this road for years thinking there's nothing out here. But Burning Sands Exploration (laughs) goes to all these just wonderful places that I had no idea that was off the I-80 highway. You know, the, the desert has a lot to look at. If you just stop and take the time to wander around, I mean, there's just so much out here, really. 
that it's not just barren nothing. I mean, there's there's history everywhere you look. Uh, the Native American settlements and that thing is just absolutely fascinating. Um, you can be going out through the desert or like in Dixie Valley, which is south of me. I don't know if you know about that. I, you know, I've heard of the Dixie Valley, but I don't m know much about it. But you can drive out there and it's just like all desert. And all of a sudden you come upon a spot where there's a military tank sitting there. Or you'll find, um, you know, anything you want to find is out there. I mean, I can't even describe it. Old mines, um, equipment, farmhouse abandoned, you know, because all that belongs to the Air Force now. So maybe you could clear something up. Maybe this is what you're talking about. So last night I was watching a program and they were talking about a fort, which name, the name escapes me right now. Um, and it was just south of uh, Pyramid Lake. And it was an old fort structures that are there. And I was like, oh, I need to check these out. So I, I miss Google map. And I always have to look at things from satellites before I go out to anything. So I'm like looking at this thing from satellites. And I just am kind of looking to see what's around the area. You know, it's desolate de um, desert. And all of a sudden, I see all these structures. So the Google map person I am, I zoom in. There's all these tanks and like tons of them and all these other structures out in the middle of nowhere and I was like uh am I supposed to be seeing this <laughs> <laughs> everybody <laughs> run if somebody starts knocking at our door <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was never here um, I was never here. um but it's they use it a, there's a lot of spaces out there that the air force uses as practice runs and what they do is they put um little Oh, I don't know what you call them now. I'm losing it. But um, they're beacons like on the tanks. And when the airplanes fly over, they home in on those beacons. It's like a radar signal. And then uh, they pretend, do virtual bombing. Oh. So they're using them for practice, for bombing runs, for practice. Oh, that's so interesting. Interesting. And some of the, some of the structures out there have them too. Well, yeah, I was like, I was freaked out when I saw. I didn't see that. <laughs> I, I didn't see that. I didn't see it. Um, well, yeah, then you and I are going to be collabing soon on something else mm -hmm. that I found in the desert in my Google <laughs> map exploring. And those are the giant arrows that yes. are the, all over the United States, there's these giant yes. concrete air arrows and they're about, mm -hmm. oh God, what are they? 20 feet long, something like that, I think. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're, they're about that. Yeah, they are. And you know what those were used for, correct? Yes. Good. For the, um, uh, the in the 1920s, they used it for air mail, mail um, so mm -hmm. the, the planes could navigate um, they had just started the air mail, mail God, why can I say that mm -hmm. air mail yeah. <laughs> uh, program in the, in the 1920s, right after World War I, they had all these surplus planes. And so mm -hmm. they decided to take the surplus planes and use them to actually deliver the mail for the first time by plane. Right. And um, they would, and they didn't, they didn't have any navigation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it was all visual. And it was a lot all of them, biplanes and stuff. Yeah, they were all biplanes, <laughs> right. And so it was all visual. So they put these huge arrows. It's like, go this way, you know, so they would follow the arrows to get from across the deserts and stuff to whatever location they're going to. So yeah, they're surprised everywhere. they're all over the nation. And they I guess they are. used to be, they used to be put painted yellow and then mm -hmm. they had beacons on them and that they still exist is what amazed me <laughs> that there's so many that still exist. Yeah. And so Burning Sands um, Exploration and I are going to collab on, I'm mm -hmm. going to go look for the ones in Wyoming because <laughs> they're just up the road from me. And she's going to go see if she can find the one, some of them in uh, Nevada. Well, and this is really handy for me because they're all in Northern Nevada. Oh yeah. Yeah. They have, you can see the route when you see where right. they're located you can see that there's different routes that they took so yeah. yeah i when i discovered those i was like i can't believe i've never heard of these before <laughs> of all the exploring i do so yeah so 
let's move on to what we're here for today. We're to get to talk about the Lovelock Caves. And so tell us what you know about the legend and the caves. So the Lovelock Caves have been in use since 2580 BC. And they said it was intensely inhabited by 1000 BC is when it was constantly inhabited. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it was used for more than 4,000 years by humans, or red-haired giants, if you will. <laughs> um, excavations were not well executed when they did go to search them, and they had lost a lot of ge ar archaeological information. Um, the cave is about 150 feet wide and 35 feet long. Um, it's in Churchill County, Nevada, which is northern Nevada, and it's near the town of Lovelock, Nevada. Um, the geology of the area is limestone, and actually they think the cave was formed by the uh, ancient Lahontan Lake that covered most of northern Nevada, and it was the wave action and, and currents that actually, mm. came, you know, hollowed it out. And then when the cave began to recede, then you find the caves, and so they started using them, so it was a long time ago. Um, they first discovered it in... Uh, 1911, and that's when two miners uh, were hired to uh, mine the bat guano, which was about six feet deep in that cave. And for those of you that don't know what bat guano is, it's bat poo poo. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's bat guano. <laughs> so um, the, it was used in fertilizer, and I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was also used in. Uh, the manufacture of certain ammunitions, like explosives. Really? So, yeah. So that's what I was told. I don't know that for a fact, but that's what I was told. Um, so they removed about six feet deep in the entire cave, and it was about 250 tons of bat guano. So <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> so uh, they shipped it to a company in San Francisco, California, and they were aware, the miners were aware of the artifacts that were in there, but they had no interest in them because they were there to make money from the bat guano. So a lot of the um, artifacts were destroyed because of their mining operation. And what they would do is take the materials from the cave, take it outside, sift it, package it, whatever they do, you know, with the bat guano, and then they would just leave these hills of refuse and there was lots and lots of broken material, you know, artifacts that's, in them. That's the, a shame. Um, they, did, they did, yeah, it is. It's a crime. <laughs> um, but they did take a lot of the more interesting artifacts that they found, and they kept them, which that's also awful that they would just take them. Um, and the loss of material and damage to the strata in the cave was just unbelievable, it, just from the mining. And after the mining was completed, uh, the mining company contacted the anthropology department of the University of California. And that's when they sent an archaeologist out uh, to document the site. Um, he was not real uh, good at doing this, and he actually missed a lot of things. Um, he actually did some damage himself. Which, which is, they did a lot in those days. Yeah, they did because they, they, you know, they didn't have the methods and things ironed out. So this is fairly new. And uh, so his first investigation was in the spring of 1912. And he recovered um, a lot of materials. They said about 10,000 pieces of material out of that cave. Um, and he was only there five months. So they just, he did some digging. He didn't do, like nowadays they do grids you know, for their excavations, mm -hmm. and they take one grid at a time, and they're careful. He was just in there just, you know, digging things up, and whatever he could find, he could find. But he did get 10,000 pieces um, from three areas, and there was a dump site outside the cave from the left from the miners, and the lower level at the end of the cave, and then um, some undisturbed refuse that was along the outline area of the cave. So, so is they it just one cave, or is there m more than it, one? It's it's there's one cave. It's the Lovelock Cave. It's one big cave, um, and it, it, what you saw in my video is it used to be much much larger, but over the years it has fallen in, 
Oh. So it, it doesn't look that big when you go into it, but it used to be huge. And it's just, you know, it's falling in over the years. So, um, so and he didn't maintain a comprehensive report. So there's no detail to the, uh, I, I did read his deport, report, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, and he did, uh, it was very generic, you know, not like what you would expect from a professional archaeologist. Right. Um, but he did make some interesting finds. So um, he established, uh, his records were ineffective, basically, because, um, you know, he just was not good at record keeping and his methods were flawed. And um, his later excavations, he returned in 1924, but he brought a more knowledgeable archaeologist with him, a Mr. Harrington, and uh, some local Paiute Indians. Mm. And so they helped with the excavation, but they kind of knew what they were looking at, and the archaeologists weren't real sure because, I mean, this was like a new era, you know, new area for them. Right. Hired Indians because of their legends and, and they have some awesome legends, but um, they knew what they were looking at. So it was very helpful. And they found fragments and pieces and the major discovery from the Lovelock cave was a duck decoy cache that they found in the West end of the cave. And there were 11 um, duck decoys that they found. Eight of them were fully intact. And three of them were like unfinished, but they're just, it's amazing. They're made out of the reeds from the old lake, the Lake Lahontan that was there. Um, there used to be a swamp there. There used to be grasses. And, and you can see from my video, this is very barren now. I mean, yeah. there's not, not even a tree. <laughs> it's, just, it's just desert. But um, well, years, you know, we're talking 10,000 years ago. Yeah. And plus, you know, glaciation came down that. Oh, I, I'm putting my geology, my geophysicist hat on. <laughs> <laughs> the glaciers came down in that area, and when they receded, they left all these lakes, such as Salt Lake. That's what Salt Lake's Salt Lake came from in Utah. Same kind exactly. of same latitude, and it left all these lakes. So life there for the Paiutes was a lot different back then. You know, the hunting yeah. and the living and everything, it wasn't desert. I mean, it was actually no. a really nice place to live. It was, it, it was very lush. It was a very lush area. You know, they, they had, like, the ancient lake had, it was abundant with fish. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, they did a lot of fishing and they ate, uh, I'm not sure exactly what grasses, but it said that they were eat, they ate some of the grasses that grew around the lake. You know, I think I read that too, and I, they're tuli. They tule, would eat, yes. Yeah, tule. they would eat the tule um, roots a lot, and they would use the reeds to make boats and other other things. Yeah, yeah and they made sandals and boats and the duck decoys and uh, very useful, <laughs> very useful material. <laughs> so and now you have do. tumbleweeds instead. <laughs> now we have dry wind and tumbleweeds, yeah. <laughs> Can't make much out of them. Um but in uh, most of the material that they got out of there went to the Museum of American Indian in New York City um, and also to um, a couple of other museums. Part of it went to UCLA and then part of it went to uh, the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Museum of Natural History uh, sent someone out in 1936, but most of it had been picked over. Uh, so he didn't really have any materials to collect to take to that museum. Um, in 1949, Robert Heiser uh, was another archeologist and he came to collect organic material for carbon dating. And that's how they found out how old the cave was. Okay. Um, he, did, he did it again in 1950 and in 1965. So this cave really is not that, I mean, it was discovered in 1911, but it could be considered a fairly recent discovery because it really wasn't that long ago when you think about it in archaeology terms. Right, um, right. And the Paiutes probably even knew it was there. Oh, and well, it, it had <laughs> been used since 2580 BC. So, you know, they knew it was there. Um, I heard from a Paiute gentleman that lives in Lovelock, Nevada, in the city, um, that one of his ancestors actually, well, you wouldn't, I guess it was his great-grandfather, um, had actually told the miners 
made them aware of the cave back in the early 1800s. And that's why the miners went out there and started mining the guano. They didn't right. just happen on it. So the Paiutes told them it was there. So they were aware of it. They were very much aware of it. But uh, they found, oh, in 1965, I believe it was, uh, they found um, human remains. So in 65, they found the human re remains, uh, not back in no. the turn of the no. century. That It was re more recent. Yeah, I thought it was later. Or earlier, I should say. I thought it was earlier, but it actually turns out to be 1960s. Uh, Lewis Napton in 1965 found human remains, and he was out there just uh, <clears throat> digging through what he could find, anything that was left. And uh, he did find some broken pottery, and um, the bones were broken and scattered. Uh, and there was a large area of it. So that could be evidence of the cannibalism, you know, because the bones are broken. And they, right. some of them showed cutting marks on them. Oh, they did? Um, yeah. So um, it, that would be what they would consider evidence of some cannibalism going on, whether you want to believe they were the redhead giants or not. Right. But it, it kind of backs up with the Indians, the story they were telling. Exactly. You know, and, and to be honest with you, a lot of people don't realize it, it's not uncommon to find cannibalism, whether it be Native Americans or even the, you know, the pilgrims, even yeah. they've have found signs that they had a bad winter and they were trapped in their fort because the Native Americans were surrounding the fort and that they started cannibalism, even the yeah. pilgrims. And they found, they've discovered it in Chaco Canyon um, mm -hmm. in New Mexico, um, you know, which are the ancients, they call the ancients um, mm -hmm. Native Americans of America. They have discovered cannibalism there too. Right. So it's, it's not an unusual practice way back then because mm -hmm. um, if, you know, it's amazing what people do if you're starving, you know. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the Paiutes were claiming that the red-haired giants were actually attacking them and chasing them down and killing them and then eating them. Um, so they, they couldn't really put too much of the bones together. It was like really broken and scattered, but it was evidence of cannibalism. Um, they established that some of the occupants' diet uh, in the cave was birds, fish, and, you know, of course, the... Uh, plants around um and they even found a prehistoric sling you know that they would use to throw rocks like slingshot right um, to use they they said it could have been used for toys games or hunting or even in battle because uh you know it's prehistoric times you're going to use what you have <laughs> <laughs> um but um they said that the slings were made from plant fiber and they found traps and nets and baskets, which is part of, uh, they have them in the museum at Winnemucca. Winnemucca Museum has a very small display, but it's very interesting what they have. And, so what, uh, they, what they have in that museum was from this cave or from other caves? Because I know there's they, many other caves. There is, there is. But this, the, what they have in the museum is specifically from the Lovelock Cave. Okay. And they did have a much larger display, but um, there again, the Smithsonian decided they were interested, so they took almost all of it. Um, they did find some skeletons when they dug down into the cave floor, and they had to go down quite a bit deeper to get to them. Um, they did find the burials um, that were, they were like mummified. It was more like... Um, something you'd see in an Egyptian type tomb. Um, and they were wrapped and prepared and all that. And uh, there were eight of the burials that were found in the cave. And then they found a few more out in the uh, lake bed below the cave. Oh. And they, they were prepared also like they had been deliberately buried in the lake area. And uh, when they did carbon dating on them, they found that they were around uh, between 4,500 B.C. to 900 B.C. Those are and old. Those are very, very old, yes. And that was the carbon dating that they got on those. 
Um, so they just had the eight skeletons. Um, and they, you could go to Winnemucca, to the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca, and see the, um, they had the skulls. They didn't have complete skeleton because they were uh, carted off to museums. But, uh, and there again, the Smithsonian took a lot of it. And, uh, but the skulls, they, I think they had three, three of the big skulls. And they, they would put the jawbone of a normal person would fit inside the jawbone of the giant uh -huh. skull. And it was quite a, quite a difference. It was quite a difference in size. And you could actually go there and see them. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ancient Aliens program. Uh -huh. But David Childress on that program um, had actually gone out there in the 70s and had done a, an actual TV, made for TV video of the bones that were found. And he stood next to them. He touched them. Um, right. They measured them, and the, you know, the whole thing. So, and then they advertised that if you wanted to see the bones, um, to ask the museum director, and they would take you downstairs in the basement, and you could actually view the bones yourself. Uh huh. So, and it's still on their website, by the way, uh, for the museum. And so I went to the museum shortly after I moved here, and I said, I would like to see the bones. And the assistant director said, oh, that was just a myth. That was just what year, a myth. About what year was that? This was uh, around 2008. Okay. So it was quite a ways that time after that. And they said, oh, that was just a myth. That never happened. We never had the bones. They never found anything in that cave. And I said, well, that's very interesting because I did read the archaeological report that they did find those bones and it was by the archeologist. So you're telling me that he made that up. And uh, he goes, Oh no, he said that report doesn't exist. And I said, but I read it. <laughs> 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 and uh, other people have seen it and it's, uh, you can get a copy of it at um, in the anthropology department in California, at the university. Um, and he says, Berkeley? Oh, no. <laughs> at yeah. the university of California, Berkeley. Yes, and uh, they will give you they they'll give you kind of a runaround, but if you press them, you can buy a copy. But um, he said, "Oh, that never happened. It was just a myth and blah blah blah." And I said, "Well, that's interesting because um, hundreds of people would come here to this museum just to see those bones after you found them. I mean, it's quite an attraction." Right. Right. And. Um, he says, it never happened. There was never any burials in that cave, nothing. And I, I just had to stand and look at him like, but there's physical evidence. You know, and there's been more, what, more than one dig. So there's probably even more than one report. To out right. There. <laughs> and, yet, and yet the museum is like, nope, never happened. So um, I just kept pressing them and pressing them and, and trying to find out information. Um, and one of the director finally, because I think I just irritated her <laughs> from asking so many questions. Uh, she said, look, she said, yes, they were here. Um, but she said the Smithsonian took them and our museum was uh, given instructions to deny that they ever existed. So take that how you will. So I wonder if this has something to do with, um, you know that the other caves that are near you, Hidden Cave and, and yes. Spirit Cave that yes. are near you. And yes. believe it or not, they found the oldest mummy that's ever, the natural mummy. Yes. That has ever been found in natural, meaning that it, it was naturally mummified. It wasn't purposely mummified. Right. You know, like a bog mummy is naturally mummified. Yeah that they found the oldest natural mummy in Spirit Cave. He's called Spirit Man. That is true. And when, and they took his body and, you know, a lot of things happened and stuff, but the Paiutes, they, they ended up having to give the bones back to the Paiutes so they could be buried properly in their tradition. And Correct. so to put these bones on display is just, mm -hmm. 
you just don't do when it comes well, um, to is, their yeah. traditions and other and other Native American mm -hmm. traditions. Well, as a matter of fact, um, the bones that they found uh, purportedly, the Paiutes didn't say too much about taking the ones out of Lovelock Cave. Because yes, they were they were their enemies. They were red yeah. red headed yeah, they were like, they cannibals were like, <laughs> eating them. <laughs> this is sacred land. Get them out of here. Um, <laughs> but they they reported were eight to ten feet tall. Um, however, uh, there is some dispute with between archaeologists. One said it was only six foot six. Right, which is so, is, is tall even in this in this day and age. And true. and a, and Paiutes aren't they're not real tall themselves and no. so a six foot six that, that's a giant my nephew is six seven and to me he's a giant i mean i i'm not a short woman and i have to <laughs> like look up at him you know well, our basketball sure. players that yeah. can be considered giants and they, and they're they considered tall today yeah. back in the 1800s and back Mm -hmm. People weren't that tall. <laughs> well, I'm only five foot two, and my oldest son is six foot five, so he's a giant <laughs> to me. Hey, my oldest is it, my oldest daughter is five ten. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and you see pictures of us? We're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I stand next to my son and I come up to his belt buckle. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> You know, people... so it's not uncommon for, and especially in those days, and then you have to go through translation mm -hmm. to call somebody that tall a giant. Yeah, because you're right. The Paiute people are not a tall people. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've met several of them, and they are not much taller than me, and I'm only five foot two. Right. So, right. you know, they're, they're not a real tall people. Even the, the men are not real tall. I mean, occasionally you get, you know, you do get yeah. tall people, but uh, the majority of the Paiute uh, Native Americans are not tall. And and that even goes along with the red hair. So you have people out there, you know, in TV shows saying they're Vikings, you know, and that's that's a great theory. But it's not outlandish to have the redheaded gene show up in a tribe or a clan. That's um, true. You know, because they're they're you know, having babies together and both parents, when it comes to redhead and I, I, you have to, both parents have to have that recessive gene. So mm -hmm. maybe both parents are brunettes, but if they have the recessive redhead gene on both sides of the family, then uh, your child can be redhead. And, you know, it's, yeah. Okay. Maybe, you know, Vikings polluted the gene pool, like, this, you know, as some people say, but also you have to remember that Native Americans are descendants of people that came over from Siberia and Asia and over the Bering Straits through Alaska and down into North America. And they most likely brought that gene with them. So to have mm -hmm. that recessive gene in a clan, it, it's not that bizarre for it to show up. There are exactly. redheaded Native Americans. There's redheaded Asians. Yes. There's redheaded, yes. you know, the Siberian tribes in Russia. And so it's it's not that outlandish <laughs> to hear that there a tribe had red hair. <laughs> no, it's it's not, you know, it isn't that un, unbelievable. No. Um, but uh not all the tribes though were <laughs> cannibals. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, well, but, I mean, yeah, look, at the, look at the Mayan people and the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. They were very, very violent people. Yes. And they were killing their own left and right in the name of their gods. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's to me, it's not that outlandish that, you know, that you have the have a violent tribe or clan out there. There's, it's, That's you know. Yeah, that's not outlandish at all, especially during um, the ancient time periods, because, I mean, uh, it's not acceptable to us now, but there are tribes even in other countries, like in Africa, for example, um, that still practice cannibalism. I mean, and even, you know, so it's not really um, an out, outlandish practice for humans to do that. It does happen. Yeah, it does happen, definitely. 
the um, spirit cave is one that I want to go to real soon. But um, a lot of the things that they took from spirit cave and um, elephant mountain cave is in black rock desert. Oh, I heard that one. Yeah. Elephant mountain cave. Um, It's uh, not too far from the uh, burning man area where they do the burning man thing every year. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the Burning Man people have visited that cave over the years, and, and uh, it's been pretty, if there was any artifacts in it, they've been destroyed or taken. That's a shame. It is. It is a real shame. But the cave Well, didn't that been, land before Burning Man took it over, wasn't it a private ranch? It was, yes. Yeah. And then now it's, it belongs to the Bureau of Land Management. Mm. Yeah. And uh, so you can you can go see the cave, but you're not. It, it's unfortunate that so many things it was like looted, basically. That's a shame. It is. It is. It is a real shame. And Spirit Cave um, is 13 miles east of the city of Fallon in northern Nevada, and that one was discovered in 1940. And uh, it's it's a very special cave to the Indians, the Paiute Indians. Um, it's a very spiritual place. Um, hence spirit cave. <laughs> um, but, but the things that they took out of there in hidden cave also is over close to there. Um, and it has petroglyphs and stuff, but, uh, those two caves are very special to the native Americans. Um, and like you said, the, 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 uh, remains that they did take out of spirit cave, they did give back to the people, to the native Americans, because it was of, spiritual significance to them right oh and well that reminds me when you brought that up we were talking about the museum and and we went off to the spirit cave tangent and the reason i had brought it up was that i was watching a video by one of my favorite youtubers and ted talkers um ask a mortician if you oh i've seen that i I love her (laughs) And she did a whole video on the oldest mummy in the world. And um, she talks about, she's, she, you know, she talks about, you know, all the different mummies. You would think that it's Egypt. You would think it's South America, but no, it's in Nevada, (laughs) you know, in a cave in Nevada. But the reason I brought her up is that she spoke to a Paiute, elder about this cave because she was trying to gather information because she was having a hard time getting information about it and she basically said without saying it that i'm not supposed to really talk much about it like after talking to this elder that she had to be closed mouth and that she really couldn't get much information from him because they don't really want you talking about these burials or you know, or any of this. And maybe that's what's happening at the Winnemucca Museum. Maybe they've been told that you, you need to be hush hush. This is our tribe and, and we don't want you talking about it. So maybe, maybe it's not coming from the federal government that it's actually coming from the tribe that you need to, you need to be quiet about this. It's disrespectful or something. I I know that, uh, things that don't fit the scientific purview Mm -hmm. um, of evolution of man, Mm -hmm. um, then they tend to hide it because they don't really want to rock the boat. Um, And the, um, it's called the Valley of the Giants in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Um, They, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but they recovered Mm -hmm. a lot of bones of seven foot tall, eight foot tall in these burial mounds and um, the Smithsonian took them in back in the uh, early twenties is when they found those and and they took them and put them on display. And there's actually pictures of people that they stood this, you know, they stood them up and people would go in and take their pictures next to these giant bones. It was sort of a tourist attraction. And then uh, in the late twenties, suddenly all that was just stopped and, there's denial that they existed. So they want to put it off as a myth that I don't understand why, because I mean, if that's a part of the history, if that's a part of human history and those people existed, I don't see what, what difference it makes if you 
acknowledge them. Right, right. But they don't. They they oh. will not. And I, I don't understand the secrecy behind it because it's, I mean, it's a part of history. It's not that big of a deal. And too many people have seen them. Um, there's people came up with pictures you know, from their grandpas and their great grandpas, you know, mm -hmm. oh yeah, look, he was at the museum and he stood next to the skeleton, or, you know, right, so there's right. evidence out there. I just don't, I don't know why, but. Yeah. But, and it's just, and it keeps becoming a, you know, it's, and we were, you know, talking about, well, it's not abnormal to have a six, seven, or even a seven foot tall man, I, you know, it no. happens. Um, but I think, excuse the pun, the tail keeps getting taller. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, why, that's why when I was um, talking about the tail in the cave, I would say, um, depending on who you ask. Mm -hmm. Because it's, well, you played that game telephone and you have a line of people. You start something, by the time it gets to the end of the line, it's gotten really exaggerated. Right, right. And, and that's the way legends go. You know that happens too. Well, this legend started with uh, Princess Sarah, Sarah Winnemucca, Winnemucca yeah. in her writings. Um, and by the way, we didn't bring up that they called these cannibals uh, Sate, 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 Satika. 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 Um, yeah. I actually have. You can actually get a copy of her book and mm -hmm. the book is called um, life amongst the Paiutes. And I'll put a yeah. link to that public domain book down in the description of this episode. Um, mm -hmm. But there, she, I have it up on my screen here. Let me see. Um, I have, I actually went into the book and did a digital search on where she talks about giants <laughs> or cannibals or anything. And she sure the heck does. Yeah, and, she does. and it's like in the one I have in front of me, it says our children are very careful, carefully taught to be good. Their parents tell them stories, traditions of old times, even the first mother of the human race and love stories and stories of giants mm -hmm. and fables. So yes. she's basically saying this in this sentence that, you know, they had stories of giants in the Paiute um, legends, but yeah. that they were, you know, part of these stories. Um, and then it goes on to say, you know, she, it's very interesting. Some of the things are a little hard to read. Um, <laughs> she did. So in the last paragraph of chapter four, is the paragraph that really Brent talks about the cannibals. Um, and she basically says in this, she says, amongst the traditions of our people is one of a small tribe of barbarians who used to live along the Humboldt River. Is the Humboldt River still there? It is. It is. It was <laughs> many hundreds of years ago. So, so she lived in the late 1800s. So she's mm -hmm. saying it was many hundreds of years ago at that time. Yeah. Um, they used to waylay my people and kill, kill and eat them. She mm -hmm. says that right in her book. So this yes. is what, this is what started this whole thing is this book. <laughs> Cause mm -hmm. this was written in the late 1800s and then they found the cave in the early 1900s. Well, um, it was 1850 when it was very first seen. And then they didn't, uh, the miners didn't start mining it until 1911. 1911, okay. And then she goes on to say, they would dig large holes in our trails at night. And if any of our people traveled at night, which they did, for they were afraid of those barbaric people, they would oftentimes fall in these holes that tribes would even eat their own dead. Yes, she says, <laughs> they would even come and dig up our dead after they were buried and would carry them off and eat them. This is straight out of her book. Yeah. Now and then they would come and make war on my people. They would fight. And as, as they killed one another on each side, the women would carry off those who were killed. Many people say they were very brave. When they were fighting, they would jump up 
in the air after the arrows that went over their heads. So she's basically saying they were so tall they could grab the arrows out of the air um, and shoot them back at, at, back at my people. My people took um, some of them into their families, but they could not make, um, make them like themselves. So I guess she's saying that she could, they couldn't change their ways. No. So, so at, at last, they made war with them. The war lasted a long time. Their number was about 2,600. The war lasted some three years. Many people killed the, uh, them in great numbers. And what few were left um, went into the thick brush. My people set the, uh, the hush on fire, uh, whatever a hush is. <laughs> um, the, um, this was right above Humboldt Lake, which is the, the caves, right? The mm -hmm. caves are right above Humboldt Lake. Then they went to work and made Thule or blush rush boats um, and went into the lake, into Humboldt Lake. They could not live there very long without fire. They were nearly starving. My people were watching them all, um, all around the lake and would kill them as fast as they would come onto land. <clears throat> yeah. At last, one night, they all landed on the east side of the lake, which is the side of the, is that the side where the cave is? Yes, yes. And went into a cave near the mountain. It was a most horrible place for my people watched at the mouth of the cave and would kill them as they came, came out for water. Mm -hmm. um, and then she goes on and on with the story of basically they started a fire in the mouth of the cave and killed them. They suffocated the, the giants, redheaded giants suffocated in the cave um, the, what was left of them after right. this war. I mean, that's a pretty detailed and it's, there's like two more paragraphs and, <laughs> and that's a pretty detailed story to, you know, yeah, to, for it not to be true. And there's nothing about that story that's outrageous to me. No, no, not for the time and the period setting. It is an outrageous and, uh, you can still see evidence. Well, in my video, I showed the rock right above the entrance is black from fire. So it is black. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. The black on the rocks are from fire damage. So it, there's evidence that there was a fire built right in the mouth of that cave at some point. Wow. Wow. So it's, it's actually, you know, and um, the end, even the Paiute Indians today, if you talk to them, and I have talked to some of them about this legend, and they wholeheartedly believe it as absolute truth. So they still, they still, I mean, they, they're still passing it down and that yes. this is true. As wow. part of their history. Yeah. So if you wanted to go out to the caves, when I was um, looking at, at an, out on a map, it's only about 30 minutes out of the town of Lovelock. It doesn't seem like it's that far out. It's about an hour and a half from my house, but it is about 30 minutes from Lovelock. Um, and it's just, it's pretty flat. I mean, you don't have to go up any mountains or anything. It's a pretty easy drive to, and from Love Lock. And it's dirt uh, uh, most of the way? It's, it it's dirt all dirt, dirt and it's uh, not well-maintained. It's, um, it's a pretty bumpy ride uh, most of the time to get out there. And if it rains, forget it, because <laughs> the desert turns to quicksand. <laughs> okay, okay. But now nor on normal days you can get out there with oh, yeah. a non four by four i would i would recommend a truck because there are ruts in the road that if you have a low sitting car you know it probably wouldn't be recommended but you can drive out there in a the car and there's two ways to get there there's the one out from love lock uh -huh. and then uh, on highway 50 just south of fallon um there's another dirt road that goes straight to it as well Okay. Okay. Which way do you recommend? I mean, what's the better way to go coming from Lovelock or? Um, I think the road from Lovelock is, is better. 
It's the I think that's way. a better way to go. Yeah. yeah. If you come up the other way, it's probably a little shorter of a drive, but it turns out to be a longer drive, if you know what I mean, because of mm-hmm. the condition of the road. Right. So is there a time of year that you recommend going? Yes. Um, don't go in the winter months, like, um, because the weather's really volatile. Like yesterday was perfectly dry. And it wasn't that cold. I woke up this morning and there's like six inches of snow. (laughs) (laughs) But you don't expect in the the desert. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize it does snow in northern Nevada. Well, I haven't been able to fly into Reno at times. There was so much snow. (laughs) Well, it is is desert, but we're at a higher elevation. So they call it a high desert. Right. And and we do get snow. Um, Not like some places, you know, not constant. But um, I mean, but there have been a couple of years where we did get like a tremendous amount of snow. Right. So not winter, so fall and, and spring. I would say um, the summertime is a pure uh, uh, is a, a a real bet that you're not going to have problems getting out there. But uh, there is no shade, and it does get hot sometimes. Well, out here, you know, we don't have any trees or anything, and it can be 110. And then there's rattlesnakes in the summer. <laughs> in, oh, yeah, don't give me a on that. They're, they're my nemesis. Um, on my property, every year I kill rattlesnakes. You know, and, and I know some people are going to be offended, like don't kill them, but those things are deadly. Yes. And I have grandchildren visiting and they run around and no. Um, the good yeah. snakes I leave, but the rattlesnakes have to go. And they're, and they're in abundance out here. So, and when you, if you go to the cave in the summertime, just be very aware. Um, any cracks or holes that you walk by, just, you know, make sure you're cautious. What about bobcats or mountain lions? Yeah. Do you have to worry about yeah. that? Um, we do have bobcats, mountain lions. Um, the bobcats you'll see down here in the valley where I'm at, um, you don't see, and you see a lot of the antelope. Mm. And, um, Mountain lions will come down occasionally. It all depends on um, their food situation in the mountains. Um, I had one come down into the valley and take two of my baby goats. Oh, (laughs) so so they will come on your property, and they, you know, it it all depends on you know, and they come at night, so it's hard to catch them. Right. But yeah, we do have those. If you're uh, if you are out in the desert exploring, you just have to really keep your eyes open because right, they right. are out. They are out there. Rattlesnakes uh, don't always rattle, so you gotta be careful. I have snake guards that I wear. Oh, that's smart. Well, Cindy, this has been so interesting. I just I cannot wait to come out and actually see the caves f- for myself. I just I know that you know hidden cave that you can actually set up a tour to get a hidden yes. cave. Um, a hidden spirit cave, cave I, I heard was blocked off though that you couldn't get to it because it's sacred. Yeah, and hidden cave is also another sacred cave but you can take tours, but um, they've got it gated off pretty heavily so that uh, somebody, uh, you have to get a guide from the Fallon Museum to and set up an appointment for them to take you to the hidden cave. Okay. Otherwise you couldn't get in. Okay, and for those of you who are not familiar with the area, Fallon is a town just east of Reno. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you were to come out in this area and fly in, you'd fly into Reno. Now, Love Lock Caves, you can go to, and you can drive out there yourself, and yeah. they you, you can hike up there, the short hike, short steep hike, um, steep. and there's panels explaining everything up there, and so you can actually go and visit the caves and go inside the caves, um, yes. And they have explanation of the story we've told and, and the legend and the whole bit. Um, but the view looks spectacular. <laughs> it's, it's gorgeous. It's, I, I love, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the desert is just nothing, but I think it's beautiful. Yeah, it just looks, everything I've seen of it looks spectacular. And it looks I down it. on this humbled lake we've been talking about, um, or the dry lake bed. Yeah, it used um, to be. They call it the Humboldt Sink now. Yeah, it, well, you know, it must have been a beautiful lake in its day. I mean, they had the, the duck decoys in the caves and, mm-hmm. you know, and they talk about using the Thule and it must have just absolutely been beautiful back in the day. So, yeah. 
But thank you so much for coming on <laughs> and make sure that you check out Burning Sands Exploration on YouTube. Um, she's got a fantastic channel and she's got a wonderful video on the Lovelock Caves to see this beauty and to actually see the caves. I'll have a link to her channel and that video in the description of this episode. And Cindy, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. This was really fun. Thank you. We will definitely do it again. And one day we'll get to meet in person. <laughs> yes, that'd be nice. Oh. Find more episodes of The Strange Podcast on major platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, Pandora, <laughs> Radio Public, and more. Please subscribe today.